Well, welcome, welcome, welcome to Seriously Social. Uh, as usual, it is your host, Lorenzo and Kosho, uh, two partners at Socially In. Uh, for those who are joining us for the first time, reminder, Seriously Social is going to be your podcast to come and check out everything going on in the world of social media, insights, trends, techniques, upcoming shifts in the market. Uh, we're going to be diving into all of that. Uh, we have about 20 years of industry experience combined. Uh, we have surprise guest interviews and just per usual, um, episode 21 is jam-packed uh, uh, with, with, with some new information and some new things for everybody this year. So without further ado, let's get into it. Brother, how you doing today? It's good, man. It's been busy kickoff to the year. Um, for those that don't know, you know, I'm the type of guy that um, for the last few years, I've started really my goals and like kickstarting my year and setting, you know, those resolutions that I feel like a lot of people do back in December. Mine really starts to kick off towards the end of January. So, okay. you know, February has been off to a hot, hot start, right? We had the Super Bowl right around the corner um, of, uh, about a week ago. We had the NBA All-Star Weekend this weekend. We had, you know, kicking off the new year, setting those goals, getting started for business. And with all of these different things going on, obviously, um, hot as ever, social media has been um, a blade. Right. So there's been a lot of developments, a lot of things going on. Um, so it's been fun. It's been busy and looking forward to seeing what the rest of 2024 holds. We had a good session or a good show last week, uh, last episode, talked about all of the different trends and things that we saw in 2023 in our learnings. Yep. Um, so we're going to dig deep, a little bit into today about some of the things for 2024 that we're seeing. And then also want to bring back to you all, um, probably in the next episode, some of those trends for 2024 that all of you should be on the lookout for as well. Man, it's going to be jam-packed. So let's actually jump and get right into it. Where we want to start off with, um, I want to start off with the ex uh, current uh, boycott that's going on. Yeah, yeah. So I want to, I just want to, I think it's a good um, part of the segment to just kind of give everybody a quick update on what's happening in the world of social on the platform. Some of these are small tidbit updates. Some of these are maybe a little bit more um, in-depth and relevant. Um, and we encourage you all to ask us questions in the comments. So if we can answer any of them, we'd be more than happy to. But yeah, let's start with X. And now this is maybe a little bit of a beaded um, topic now at this point, but I don't really believe we've had the... Um, We've ne we haven't had the opportunity to actually talk about it and discuss about what we're seeing in the world of X. But just a quick recap for those that may not be up to date on it. Elon Musk, with all of the different things that were um, happening on X, um, with the support um, that you know he was providing um, last year, whether it was to political parties, to specific groups of people, to affinities, all in all, there were brands that were upset with the way that Elon was ultimately managing things. And a lot of brands started to pull away from advertising to start think, think, think about the big brands, right? Like Disney, think about, you know, Procter and Gamble, et cetera. These big, big brands spending a lot of money on X.com started to pull away and boycott X. So, um, obviously there's opportunities when things like that happen. And at that same time, there's that side of it of, you know, where do you take a stand and what do you stand by? Because at the end of the day, the opportunity is with all of that money being pulled back, um, brands that weren't spending as much or businesses that may have not been spending, the opportunity for them to win started to come about. So where do you take that? There's two questions is really, what should we be thinking about when it comes to X? What's happening in the landscape? How should businesses be thinking about it? But then two, where does the moral compass um, start to take lead when it comes to situations like that. Yeah, and, and you bring up a few points. I'm, I'm actually going to answer them and, and backwards and kind of start with the moral aspect because I find myself increasingly including and considering the moral aspects of a lot of decision-making financially, just a lot more than I used to do. Um, you, you know, just even thinking through, you know, uh, potentially looking at getting a Tesla, for example, and then you know, the investment of that much and saying, okay, you know, do I support some of the things that he's doing as a brand and all of that different type of stuff. And so from the moral perspective, I think that this situation is highlighting something that I think that all platforms and a lesson that business owners should also be taking for this. And it's the same thing that I just mentioned is that people do care much more about the morality of your brand, the morality of your business, of your leadership, 
um, uh, than they cared before. And they're actually taking that stuff into account when it comes to making business decisions. And I think that's one of the things that's really shifting from a business perspective. Um, historically, years ago, 10, 15 years ago, people didn't think that much about that different type of stuff. You know, you you people weren't really digging into the the lifestyle of the, the, the executive of a company and how controversial were there and different things, you know, based upon that research and feedback, deciding mm -hmm. not to do business with the company. And that's just not the way that people are doing things anymore. Anymore. There's so much more competition in every space. People don't have to go. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 there's not a monopoly on a lot of different things anymore. And so I think one of the most important things is that the realization that from a buyer's perspective, that there's a shift in what's important to people who are buying. We're seeing it on X. We're seeing it when people are looking and evaluating our services and different things like that. And so I think that's some of my first thing of uh, thoughts about what's going on is there's an important shift in that. Um, mm -hmm. People are caring much more about, again, what do you represent? Uh, how do you think about these things? What, what, what stand are you taking when it comes to politics, environmental causes, all of those different things right there? So um, I think this is just the beginnings of a real pretty different and dramatic shift in how people are going to be making informed buying and purchasing decisions. Again, whether and this will change, it won't always be about X and different things like that. So oh, those agreed. are some first immediate thoughts is there's a shift in the, the the importance of morality when people are buying whether or not people agree with it i 100 percent agree there's actually an app happening on tiktok right now because you bring up a point that you know we're talking about x and elon's at a different scale because of obviously who he is he, you know he's at this point you can consider him a worldwide celebrity like he's that well known so a little bit different it's not an apples to apples but an apples to orange comparison what's happening on tiktok right now is a lot of um you know, experts in social media and marketing are coming out and saying that not only on TikTok, in general, in social media, brand pages are dead. Now, they're not taking it to the extreme extreme of saying like, you know, obviously brand pages are dead. You know, we've built yes. a whole business behind this. So there's obviously some relevancy there, but more so the point of people are still care about what brands say, but they are starting to care more about who the people behind the brands are and what they're saying, right? And how that impacts the decision they make from the brand. So I am more of a believer of right and like, yes, you need to have that and the brand also communicating um, to only amplify it more. But you're right. There's more and more people that are being morally conscious, whether it's just because of what society is saying or because of their own intent of like, hey, I want to try to do the right thing. I want to make the right decision. Or I want to believe the in the right people. Um, so it's becoming real. And that's we saw that with X and so many brands pulled back. Um, but like I said, there were those that from because of that moral standpoint, from that righteousness, and I don't want to go without saying, you know, what the issue was, but ultimately, you know, he addressed um, with this whole Israel and, um, you know, situation that's going on and Jewish people and his affinity with them. And so it's important, right? That's a real thing. And, you know, it contradicts to a specific group of people. So I think ultimately, Going back to the point of where do you make that moral stand? You're right. I think brands, people, everybody in the world in general is leaning more and more towards that side of the scale. Um, and because of that, I do think things, decisions like this impact the brand at the end of the day. But to that point, um, how long does it last, right? H&M had a similar issue, you know, not too long ago with the, obviously some things that they ran, but then people go back, uh, go to the mall and people are back in H&M obviously shopping. So it's, you know, who, who takes advantage of it? Who doesn't take advantage of it? Where do you say? You said something that I, I do think that the timing yeah. and how long will this last is important. However, I do think that this year, there are two things that are going to happen that will make the timing this year be a little bit more different and unique than it is. And I think it's number one, the increase in competition. Everything just has a massive increase in competition. The other thing that's very important to this is I think it's the scarcity of resources this year. That is going to be the other thing that also amplifies the decision making process because now not only do I have more options to go to. So now if I so again, let's just keep using X. If I'm an advertiser and I know that my ideal audience sits on X, it could potentially be a great use. Well, now there's multiple different places that you can reach them. You know, we talked a lot last year about finding opportunities to reach your micro audiences and different things. You don't always have to be at the places of the masses. There's lots of opportunities to do that. But it's also going to be the scarcity of resources now. Now, if I only have 
$2 to spend, whereas last year I had $5 to spend, I'm also going to ask more questions about where those $2 are going. I have to. I'm going to ask more. I'm going to care more about that type of stuff. Now, that is what I think is going to increase kind of the the place at which a conversation about morality starts to increase that now, because now it's like, well, listen, if we're only going to make one investment into one place, mm-hmm. we're going to consider all of those different things and things that may not used to be as important have to increase in their importance right now, just because there's a scarcity of resources. I need to take every single thing into account. And that's where I think that, yes, people will forget. People will, Twitter's going to be okay. Elon's going to be okay. Will that make this year a potentially much more rougher year from an advertising standpoint and things like that? I definitely think there's potential for him to lose a significant additional dollars in 2024, though, 100% because of that. Yeah, so I 100% agree. And because of obviously all those things happening, to, you know, X.com is a wild, wild west. You know, we've talked about this, obviously, when he first took over. Yes, to to everyone's point and what I really believe the business should be doing, if you truly believe who you're wanting to get in front of, like Lorenzo was saying, really makes sense. It's a top priority. It's your top one or two or three channels. You really see an opportunity. You know, you take advantage of it, right? Uh, Like I agree that there is a moral standpoint, um, but I also believe that um, all of us have the right to um, take care of the businesses that we've invested in, build something and not necessarily do anything wrong by somebody else and still find opportunities where maybe advertising on um, Twitter or um, being um, organically active on there and doing all of the different advantages that it still does persist, um, taking advantage of those things. But I do agree that if you are unsure, if it is not one of your top mediums, if it's not something that's going to be a core focus, um, it's maybe better to sit back and watch right now just to kind of see what's happening. So obviously we're experimenting, you know, we work with ma- brands and businesses of many different sizes. So we're seeing, we're gathering insights, we're looking at what's happening. Um, so we see opportunities, but I do agree that right now is maybe not the best time to hop in if you don't know exactly for sure what you're wanting to do there. Last thing I'll say on that, that I'm very interested in following and will continue to talk about this topic I'm curious, Thread's response to all of this. For sure. So opportunity, like I said, in every door. It's an opportunity right now. It is is an open space. It's an open opportunity right now. And there are some things they could, uh, Thread's could potentially do to really capitalize on a lot of this. And I'm very curious just to see what, if anything, um, investments and things are going to be happening. As you all know, uh, stay tuned because as they come out, we will definitely be talking about them. Absolutely. All right. Let's go to the next um, LinkedIn. Let's start there now. All right. So LinkedIn. Yeah. Um, few different things. Obviously, LinkedIn is becoming um, the place to go when it comes to organic reach. Right. Yes. You know, TikTok is still the leader. Um, YouTube shorts are still doing tremendous things. You know, Facebook reels in its own right are doing it, um, its own thing. But LinkedIn itself, obviously a B2B focus in the most aspects or what initially comes to people's minds. But a lot of people are starting to be able to take what it is that they're doing, go to a B2B audience, um, but still realize that it's human beings at the end of the day and what they may have, um, if they can apply it in the right way, understand the nuances of LinkedIn and how people speak and what they're looking for. um, There's an opportunity for them to, you know, do business there as well. So LinkedIn, one of the things that a lot of people have been talking about recently is all of this organic content, right? Publish, you know, if you can two, three times a day, obviously that's hard at minimum, you know, two to three, four times a week is, you know, what the recommendation is. So if you're not publishing all the time, um, that's, you know, step number one, where to start. But let's say you are publishing. There are many people out there that are publishing. They may not be seeing the results that they're looking for. Um, one of the things that people have been talking about or what experts have been saying is, do hashtags really even matter anymore on LinkedIn? It's because of the whole aspect of thought leadership and what people have been um, starting to prioritize, I would say when it become, when they're on LinkedIn, it's engaging with these comments, leaving their two cents, putting out their own thought leadership pieces. But where do hashtags play a role, right? We've seen hashtags forever. They work on social. They're great for discovery. But there's this thing going on saying that hashtags on LinkedIn don't matter no more. And what really matters is utilizing what you would count as a hashtag more so in the description of what you're talking about. And LinkedIn's algorithm naturally picks that up and 
likes that better is what's been um the recent findings is what's uh, what i've heard well linkedin's algorithms in regards to hashtags have always kind of been a little finicky um there's always been things like for example some things historically in the past with with issues with their hashtags uh, if you're using long form or long tail t uh, types of hashtags and things like that if you would put words like and and things like that in between your words, as opposed to just using just the keywords themselves that you would do, sometimes that would like scan your post and be treated as spam and different things like that. So then they went and they were really limiting the amount of hashtags. So for a while, it was like, do not put more than like two hashtags or it'll be suppressed for spam and different things. So LinkedIn's always been just a very wonky place from a hashtag strategy specifically, number one. What I know and what we've been seeing is that on top of, yes, you're correct. It's definitely about the content. It's also about utilizing other LinkedIn features as of late. And by doing those things, we've seen a lot of rewards from LinkedIn uh, uh, when you're doing that. Perfect example. Uh, some people out there may have been getting invited to contribute to a collaborative article on LinkedIn. That's one really big thing that they're doing, using um, um, uh, uh, subject matter experts to contribute and really provide expertise and different things like that. By leveraging different things like that, they've relaunched their um, their newsletter tool. Uh, tool they uh, for individual profiles. It used to just be a blog. Now they've redone some things from like a newsletter feature and things like that. What we've learned is that when you're leveraging and utilizing all of those different tools, that's when we're starting to really see a ton of, of exponential reads, a ton of potential to go viral and different things like that. It isn't necessarily the, the one specific thing. It's like, man, if you were to have a couple more hashtags on your post, they would have exponentially increased your reach that you have gotten. So what we're seeing, it's not a make or break thing. It is something that does need to be done appropriately. It does have its benefits because just like over every other platform, hashtags are searchable. And that's the purpose of what you're supposed to be using that for. It's it's thinking through a strategy of if I was a person that may not already be connected to this social media campaign, but I was to be looking and searching and researching, how do I capture those additional eyes and different things like that? So that part of this strategically and conceptually still makes sense to use, but I would say it's not a make or a break thing. Um, there are other things like utilizing the features, utilizing the tools, utilizing some of those other things that we have seen have really, LinkedIn has really rewarded um, profiles and accounts that have taken advantage of things like that. I agree hundred percent. So biggest takeaway for LinkedIn is try the new newest features that they're promoting organically. You know, you do need to get a good frequency going to start publishing, try different, you know, varieties of content and hashtags. Yes, you can still use them. Uh, it's not the end of the world. If you don't incorporate it into your messaging, if you can. And I do agree. Um, if you're more, you know, generic um, with your hashtags, then you have a better chance for discovery, but you also have higher competition because there's probably more people using that hashtag. So kind of pick and choose your um, situations there when it comes to the proper hashtag um, and the right balance between ramping up on, you know, industry relevant or just keywords and stuffing them in there. Um, and also talking about your brand relevant keywords at the same time. So just be considerate of that. All right, let's hop we over. Can whole, we can have a whole section on a proper and appropriate hashtag strategy and usage. That's um, all right, let's uh, swip over next platform. Let's get into IG and Instagram. Yeah. Obviously, there's numerous things that they have working. One of the biggest updates that we've seen um, and that we're absolutely following is uh, from an engagement standpoint. Um, and, th and that's one of their new features where they allow polling and comments. Um, well, well, have you experienced it? Have you have you had a chance to uh, actually publish any um, uh, personally or anything like that? Um, have you participated? What are some what are you saying? I've not published one myself. I actually haven't even seen if I have the ability to. I have voted in one. So uh, they are rolling it out in um, spurt. So this is probably still not really accessible for many, many different um, individuals and brands. Um, but I have seen it on one where I participated with it. And yeah, really the biggest piece is engagement, right? For the longest now, um, and we talked about this either in the last episode or the episode before, but, you know, Instagram, we talked about is the major leagues, right? It's become hard. Social media isn't easy. 
in order to be successful on Instagram and really um, start to grow and um, develop a following and be relevant and do the things that all you know businesses and even influencers um, want to do, it's hard. And I believe um, this is just one of those things that Instagram is incorporating to try to bring back more value to what's happening on Instagram. It is still um, one of the most utilized platforms. I believe it's second or third when it comes to how many pieces of content get published on it daily. Um, so the usage is still there. It's not like Instagram's dead. No, by no means is anybody saying that. It's just hard to actually grow, and you know what most people are looking to achieve from social to accomplish those things. And because of that, I do believe these polls and just being able to get more insight, more data, more engagement, more feedback is always valuable to individuals and to brands themselves. So maybe you've always had a problem um publishing content and getting responses because you're like hey do i ask a question in my copy do i give information um you know how do i do something that's going to encourage interaction in this case i think you can do both now right you can educate you can bring value you can talk about something and now you have that option of hey not only did i want to ask you all of these things i wanted to i mean sorry not only did i want to educate you on all of these things i now can also ask you the question of you know, what is your feedback? Hey, maybe there's a specific thing I'm talking about travel, top five places to travel. Well, which one was your favorite? Now you can just start to get more feedback outside of leaving value along with educating um, people. So it's a two-part process, right? Now you get to educate and get feedback all in one versus in the past, where it was more of a one-prong approach. Was right. I getting feedback and engagement? Was I trying to educate? What was I trying to do? So- not just that simple. I mean, you know, internally, you you, you know, one of our, I guess, um, uh, core ways of executing is we always talk about participatory content. And I love the compliments of that now is a participatory copy and participatory captions. Perfect. And now think about that now. Now you have stories that are in, in reaching for interaction and engagement and things like that, complemented by captionings that are doing the same. I definitely think this is going to increase that uh, in, in platform type of engagement, um, which that's just one thing that Instagram that I think they're doing a great job of is uh, is doing that right now. So everything from Instagram shop, just your ability to essentially stay in Instagram for much longer mm -hmm. um, uh, than they were doing historically. I think they're doing a great job of adding features that will benefit advertisers essentially um, from a conversion and ROI type of standpoint. Um, okay. Just that. 100%. And remember, the biggest takeaways really from this feedback and data is to try to figure out what's working, right? Because, right. I mean, simple stat, I can't remember verbatim the percentage, so nobody quote me on this, but I believe it, it was very high. If I'm not mistaken, it was almost 60 to 70, 75%. Um, the biggest variable for conversion rate optimization or to improve conversion rate in general is um, messaging and creative. And the, you have to test those things. And the only way to test those things is, like I said, get the feedback, see what's working, see what's not, try new things, don't be afraid, but learn from what from all of that information. And this is just one of those another ways, like I said, on Instagram, another avenue to hopefully you can learn, educate, improve um, from what your audience is saying, whether it's your product, whether it's a service, whether you're an individual, and just getting feedback on you know what your audience um, is passionate about and what they like and what they don't like. It's funny, just about once a year, Google actually does um, an analysis where they ask that exact question right there. What's more important, uh, targeting, demographic targeting and things like that, or creative and messaging? For years now, consistently, creative and messaging has by far been the much more uh, deciding factor of a successful campaign than targeting. Just that simple. I mean, you can find the most needle in a haystack person. If your creative is whack, it doesn't matter. And if you have great creative, great creative can educate, convince, convert, do all of those different things right there. So yeah, no data supports that time and time again. Creative sure. and messaging is much more important than can I find in this this finite list of people and different things like that. Hundred percent. 100% agree. Okay, awesome. Let's jump to Meta. Obviously, Meta is always, Facebook in this specific case, is always doing, you know, something, right? Um, they've started to, and TikTok's already done this, so obviously it doesn't surprise any of us, you know, with Meta following um, um, suit. 
but they've opened up a talent management tool, essentially, right? Being able to manage um, talent that can really do a multitude of things for you, whether it, they're creating content and they're able to help you from a supply and distribution standpoint, whether it's products and them being able to, you know, make money and utilize affiliate, um, you know, revenue to push and promote your product um, to not only benefit your business, but themselves as well. Maybe it's influencers and creators that you're working with and being able to manage those relationships. So obviously a multitude of different use cases on how you can um, leverage that tool. But in, uh, in the general sense, all of the social platforms are looking for ways for businesses and brands. And maybe you're even an influencer and you're on the flip side looking to connect with business and brands essentially a gateway or a marketplace, so to say, where y'all can, they can start to um, look into each other or leverage each other for opportunities. Um, I don't know how much brands and um, businesses or even the creators themselves are leveraging these things. Like I said, TikTok was really the first one to, I would say, successfully ramp it up with their creator marketplace. But Meta has it now. YouTube has something similar. TikTok is, I guess, what are your thoughts about... Um, the aspect in general of now creating these social platforms, creating these marketplaces that are allowing this type of thing, what benefits do you see for um, individuals? What benefits do you see for businesses? What are your thoughts overall in general? So I'll start with my overall thoughts, then I'll get into some of the benefits because I've looked a lot into this because we've gotten a rash of inquiries for clients who are building very similar or prospects building very similar types of platforms to do just this. So my first thoughts are that this is the place that we're trending towards. One thing that me, you, Keith have talked about, our CEO have talked about for years now, and, and it spent a lot of hours is that the cost of content <laughs> and the cost of creating quality content is going to just plump. It just is with the rise of AI, these different type of resources, all of those things, what it takes to create the same high quality piece of content. It's just not going to cost the same amount of money. It's not going to take the same amount of resources anymore. So the idea of building infrastructures like this, we kind of foresee and knew that was kind of happened because it's like a lot of things in our society. A lot of things are becoming open source. Yep. Just that simple. Why would I pay a premium? And I mean, this is hurting us. I mean, this is for, you know, we're always transparent. I was thinking the same thing, yep. Why would I pay a premium to an agency like Socially In to just essentially match make? Whereas if, and these are the types of industries that are very disruptive, what if we can create a platform that essentially would match make for you? Now I don't have to pay the premium. I just have to pay access to the platform. I can still get access to the quality, same types of creators, boom, and keep on going. Uh, we're going to see more of it is kind of my, but just that the simple version of it. We're going to see very specific third party, private people who get invested to do it. Um, you're going to see platforms like the large guys figure out and create their own versions of it. Just that simple, because that's also how the people respond and market there. Um, those are my thoughts overall. Mm -hmm. I think there's a ton of benefits. I think there's cons, but I think there's absolutely some great benefits as well. So we'll start with that for individuals. Um, it's the ability now to grow your business, promote your brand, push yourself out there um, for very low cost. Go show. I mean, it's just that simple now. Me and you right now can go on to one of those platforms and sign up to be a micro or a nano influencer or something like that. We can find a brand that's like, hey, I got $75 to do something like that. And me and you now can go and explore being an influencer. No credibility, <laughs> no resume, no experience, no nothing. I like things like that. I like the I, I like a society where people can go out and people can find ways to build businesses and build careers and different things like that. I I personally like that about the way that we can kind of do things. I think that's a, some big benefits to to individuals. It's, you can go and make some money, man, um, using those talents. And from companies, obviously, uh, there's going to be a cost savings. Um, just that simple. Now, you know, when I'm thinking about how much we charge just for management of this type of stuff, and that's just to manage it. That's just to, to be in the systems, do some communication, handle some admin and operations and different things like that. Um, those costs, people don't necessarily have to pay those costs. So it's going to be up to agencies like ours to really start to ask ourselves, what is number one, the true value that we bring? Mm -hmm. Based upon that value that we bring, is there more value of it that we can bring? And then obviously, is there a way that we can bring this same amount of value and do it a little bit more efficient? 
And unfortunately, that's just the response we're going to have to have for something like this, Coastal, because as a company, I mean, we've been in a situation ourselves before. We may have to say there's a quality and a really great way we know we want to do it. Are we in a financial position to do it right now? Based upon the, the potential return that we can get, well, you know, our favorite thing to say is you got to start somewhere. Don't got to start perfect. 100%. We get it. And it will provide companies the ability to start somewhere without it having to be perfect. And those are going to be some of the biggest benefits that it offers. I 100% agree. I mean, it's it's like they say, as technology, you know, continues to evolve, it was almost inevitable that, you know, this was going to happen. I mean, it's, it's already happened, right? Like, think about it was just at a smaller scale and more in specific segments. And that's why it was probably less mentioned. But um, the influencer companies or the tools that created these influencer networks that you can vet and search and find them pretty much were doing this just at a smaller scale. Now it's pretty much opening it up to every, pretty much everybody, right, who can consider themselves a creator. And obviously these social networks already had the masses and the brands and businesses there to be that connector of the two, right? So you're right, 100% right in the sense that the cost of the barrier of entry is much lower. The cost of the entry is much lower. Now, there is still that strategic approach to where, you know, sure. you, you're right. One is better than zero. So just doing it is now the, the marketplace exists. Um, but there is still obviously the right way to do it. And I still believe there's a lot of value that agencies and businesses and um, marketing um, firms can provide, consultants, et cetera. But yeah, you're right. Even now, the average person can start to understand, hey, there's a marketplace that exists. I want to get this done. It's very easy for me to facilitate it, and um, I can do it. So I'm, I'm excited about it. I love it. I think it's great for both, like you said, there is a con for certain things. But I think it just, like you said, makes us need to be better at our craft, it makes us need to be better at how we're efficient, how we optimize, how we bring the bigger value because if you can make ten dollars for every one dollar still makes sense well i mean kosher the other thing is and this this is exciting i mean think about the the increase in diversity of options that you now have as a brand as a brand user yep. now as opposed to having you know maybe 30 or 40 people you know there may be 100 150 people who may fit who still could be a good option people that you never ever would have had an opportunity to look at or consider and different things like that so there's sure. definitely some but you, you're right man you're missing out on the strategic aspect of it again that is why people pay us to do that different type of stuff um the time the efficiency of it um as you know we run tests all the time about well, what could you have done with our without our service fee? And then were the results that we got, even including our service fee better? Um, and oftentimes our service fee is definitely worth it because of the expertise, the access to different things that we have, um, the, the, the industry knowledge, you know, the fact that we've been doing this now for 12 years and this is the only thing we've ever done. Um, mm -hmm. So it's little things like that, that all companies are going to have to really start to think through that because automation is coming for anything. The social media ain't, ain't, is no... It's, it's no different than anything else, man. I mean, brother, they've been saying that they were going to replace the workers at McDonald's for 40 years now. Mm -hmm. AI automation is coming for everybody's industry, everything. This won't be the first. This won't be the last. It's just that simple. No, 100% agree with that. Okay. So I do because um, we do have a hard stop today. So I, I want to save some time for um super bowl talk about the commercials obviously i know that's always a fun favorite for everyone um so we're gonna go over these next few points um a little bit quicker but didn't want to skip over them so moving into tiktok obviously the biggest thing that most people recently have seen you go to people's profile pages there's tons of videos um maybe more than half if not um at least 40 percent um none of the sounds are working what's going on right so obviously maybe you heard maybe you didn't um from the all the people out there but the whole debacle between tiktok and universal music and having to remove all of those different sounds um obviously a lot of um you know people's um pieces of content now don't have doesn't have sounds including brands as well but on top of that um segueing right into the point that i was wanting to make which is tiktok is now exploring creating music with ai you know you talked about ai right before this as well um doesn't surprise me they were probably thinking about this kind of knowing ahead of time that all of this was looming 
But um, I think there's a two part question here. Obviously, what should people be thinking about and brands be thinking about when it comes to this copyrighted music and just, you know, best practices. But on top of that, this whole AI generated music and what TikTok is doing there and allowing you to literally type in I want uh, romantic pop music, Justin Bieber, and it tries to come up with something based off of that um, text input. We, I, I know we we're going to go through that uh, in our next call between this, between Sora, between all of that. I can't wait to take a deeper dive into what all of this is about to do. Bro, this stuff is game changing. This stuff, this, this, this stuff is super game changing when it comes to it. One thing I will say, though, <clears throat> talking about strategy and how all of these things change and things. It's funny. I don't think a lot of people, you know, when we have conversations with prospects and clients, we talk about on TikTok, very specific strategy that's different. You know, including things like trending sounds and things like that, that you don't have to worry about on other stuff. And we talk about that. And a lot of people are like, ah, it doesn't matter. And we're like, no, nah, if you're really talking about virality and things like that, there's a lot more technical things than just, is it a cool video and different things like that. This situation drilled into the heads of the people, the importance of different things like that, because those sounds and different things like that were a lot of the reasons that people were getting some of the views, the attention, right. the draw. And that just killed them when they did that and not having a replacement strategy for a lot of that different type of stuff moving into the new year. So that's another big implication I come from. That is, that's why it's important to understand the nuances of various specific platforms um, so that you can have game plans for when stuff like that happens and game plans when doesn't necessarily go and you can already go and pivot and keep on rocking and rolling. So you don't lose that engagement and that reach. I 100% agree. We were actually ironically just talking about that today which was, you know, contingency, you know, contingency, yep. right? It's, we're building something internally um, off of GPT that we are wanting to help um, increase efficiencies um, between our team. And because of that, immediately we're like, hey, all of these great benefits, but on the counter side, most people don't even think about this. What if the technology was gone? Now we don't have no anticipation or expectation of GPT going anywhere outside of continues to evolve and honestly just become better. But at the end of the day, technology is technology, right? Um, so thinking about anytime you're doing something, you don't, this is not like thinking about, hey, let's always have a plan B because I'm also not the type that's always like, hey, you need a plan B. But certain times when you're doing something that's so drastic that you know, like, hey, if there is a vulnerability, um, let's think about it and maybe have a little bit of an idea of what we should do is not, is not a bad idea for sure. So 100%. All right, let's run uh, through the next two um, last two more platforms. Yep, go do a couple more updates. Yep, and then we can get into um, just hardcore Super Bowl, obviously Usher. I'm sure people want to hear about that. Um, but yeah, last two points. So Amazon is rolling out. Um, obviously, you know, we're talking about social media and, you know, they're like, hey, where's Amazon come, come into the picture? But Amazon is obviously a big marketplace, but they're rolling out with something called Amazon Posts a very social first aspect to Amazon where brands, Amazon verified retailers, they're able to create this like social first pieces of content to promote their products. Um, I have not utilized it yet, actually. I know Amazon's been um, a little bit vocal about starting to push it. Um, we've even communicated with them on opportunities that you know they're seeing in the marketplace of where brands can leverage it. So it is real. It's rolling out. Um, I don't think it's started to really scale or become that big yet. But anything to allow an obviously giant like Amazon to entertain the social first aspect of what we've seen in society, um, you know, I believe it's making its um, hot takes in in the um, advertising industry. So what are just your thoughts about that? Um, have you seen it? Have you heard about it? But Amazon is exploring this social first um, social first technology with Amazon Post. Uh, very simply, I have heard of it. I have seen it. I am actually surprised this was not done earlier. Right. To me, I thought I've always kind of thought that Amazon had an opportunity to almost be like the easiest way to kind of wrap my head around it is if Reddit and Nextdoor were to combine and make an app. That's the kind of social that I envision that Amazon almost always had the ability to do. Imagine it, uh, this, I mean, because people go to the shop and do all of those different things. So imagine almost treating it like a community where you can talk about threads, whether they were 
product specific threads or service thread, that's what I literally can see. And I can see that getting a ton of engagement um, and, and in its own kind of version of a social campaign. So I'm actually surprised that this was not done earlier. Yeah, that's a fair point. I mean, actually. Last thing, I mean, because when you think about it, there's very few companies who even have the potential between infrastructure, dollar amount and everything to even rival Facebook, you know, we talk about creating a new social platform and what does it take? And I think it is going to take, like we mentioned this in one of our episodes um, some time ago, a country or a company like this mm -hmm. that wants to make their own version of like the social media that then uh, will have the proper funding and all of that stuff that then just basically gets momentum and kind of takes from there. So this actually, we kind of alluded sure. to something like this. So I'm, I'm not surprised actually. And I'm, I'm actually more surprised that it took this much time than I am that it exists. Yeah, that's a, definitely a good point. And no no one's to knock, you know, obviously what Amazon has done. There's probably a thousand initiatives that they've worked on. And this probably was one of those ideas that sat on the back burner for a long time until it just became important enough to, you know, start to really um, amplify. Um, but yeah, definitely be on the lookout for that. If you are an e-commerce brand, if you're um, selling on Amazon, if you're somebody who's new to the marketplace and is thinking about um, being on Amazon, this is a great opportunity for you to start to leverage something new that I believe um, and we believe here associated and that could be a large technology. Um, so stay on the lookout for it. Lastly, YouTube Shorts always um, still a beast. It's rocking and rolling. Um, there's only really one thing I want to say about this and why I still believe people should be thinking about Shorts very seriously, if not just in general repurposing content. It's okay. the one medium where shelf life, everything has expirations, right? You go to the store, you look at your food expirations, you're in your fridge, you're looking at expiration. Well, social media posts have expirations as well. Yes, you're right. They do live on your profiles forever. Technically or theoretically, you could go back and forever find them. But who actually does that? Outside of, you know, time decay is real. So outside of maybe very rare instances, if you're somebody who, you know, somebody was just stalking you and really going back and looking at everything, most pieces of content are, um, they have a shelf life. They have a short shelf life. They only live for a very long time, um, a very short time, sorry, before time just goes by and, you know, people move on to the next thing. YouTube Shorts is different. YouTube Shorts is obviously um, YouTube, the second largest search engine behind Google, Things live longer, and even for brands that are truly wanting to bring value, provide um, entertainment, do something to really um, educate um, and um, make sure that they're engaging with their audience, it allows them to create opportunities for that piece of content to live. Um, it's almost hard for me to say forever, but as close as you can think about as forever when it comes to social media. So that's the biggest benefit. Your content can live forever. You title it properly. You think about the keywords. You think about what the people are saying when it comes to your specific product or service and what they may be searching. And you have the opportunity to be found two years later by somebody finding that um, piece of short, for short form content. I think it's just that simple. I think you're, I think you're right on. I think one other thing I'll, I'll throw this little tidbit. Um, a tip for anybody who may feel a little bit uncomfortable about Kosho's advice. If you would like to, one cool thing that you can do is you can actually shoot the same video with either different intros right out the gate, or you can very simply take an old video and then just edit a new intro into that same video. The cool thing about that is it don't have to take a bunch of resources to create a whole new piece of content. You can still re-put out the same piece of content with very minimum and little work and things like that. So that's a tip that we've learned and that we've potentially done um, um, for some different things and stuff like that. So everyone has it. Um, if, if you're a little bit nervous about it, it's also easy to just reshoot the intro. Or you can even just shoot multiple intros with your videos to start off with. Swap out the intros and boom, uh, increase the, the, the shelf life of your creative just like that. 100%. Love it. All right. And so let's wrap up with the fun topic for the day. Go ahead, brother. I was just going to say, hopefully those were some small tidbits. Like I encouraged earlier, ask questions. We love giving people updates on what's happening on the social platforms. And hopefully y'all are starting to see some of, um, so take some of these takeaways and implement them and see what kind of feedback um, y'all are having as well. Yes. Yeah, so let's get into the fun part. Let's segue. Um, there's really... You know, there's two points. I think we can spend the most of the time on the Super Bowl, but just talking about brands, just talking about celebrities, just think about all of these amazing things. 
Um, one thing that I do want to probably bring um, into the next um, podcast that we have is harping a little bit deeper on surprise and delight strategy, specifically. And I think real quick for about two minutes, we can focus obviously on what Stanley did last year. I think they're one of the biggest success cases. Um, but surprise and delight is really what has been separating brands on social media and making people who are true advocates of your brand feel like you know they're loyal members, right? People, um, and sorry, I keep saying people, but brands have the um, opportunity now to create subscriptions. Obviously, influencers have the opportunity to create subscriptions and things of this nature on the, all of the social platforms, going back to the opportunities of, hey, how can people monetize, right? One of the ways is by providing this exclusive type of content, right? So think about um, surprise and delight as being a form of exclusive content. They're not necessarily paying for it, but they have to do certain actions or activities in order to become um, part of this surprise and delight strategy, right? It's to hold it there for your true loyal fans. There is also opportunity for maybe somebody being very new and you even surprise and delighting them. So I'm not necessarily saying only hold it for exclusive, but if you're like, hey, I don't really know what to do from exclusive exclusivity standpoint, I would say focus on a surprise and delight strategy because it's a low cost of entry. It's a really good strategy and it's a good way to help showcase your brand as being authentic. And we talked about, you know, authenticity on the last episode and how it's going to be really important in 2024. So what are your thoughts about what Stanley did when it came to their surprise and delight and the impact that impact that it had? I think, well, first and foremost, surprise and delight is something that I think every brand should be taking advantage of. It's And the reason is because if you take yourself and put yourself into your consumer standpoint, you know, out of your work and different things like that, how cool is it whenever you got something free? How cool is it when it doesn't matter what a little is? It doesn't matter if you went to the 7-Eleven and you got a candy bar and you found out you got an extra candy bar for free doesn't matter. It's those little things right there that make you remember the brand, make you want to come back. It creates those loyal advocates. Uh, advocates. It at least creates the positive thought or uh, talking and positive word of mouth about it, even if it doesn't translate immediately to a dollar. And so I just think that first off, it's just something that can be done because it's easy. It increases your branding. It shows your customers and your clients that you appreciate them. But also, if done right, it will be a way to increase your branding, to increase the, your word of mouth, to get people. I mean, I don't know the numbers. I, I'd be, I would love to be in a marketing meeting to see what happened to all of Stanley's analytics from web traffic, follower count on social media, engagement. And I bet all of that stuff skyrocketed after they started doing the surprise and delight. And I'm not even talking about the how many actual units did they sell. We all know they sold a bunch of them. But the residual that they're going to get from that, the, the, the brand equity that you're going to get from that, that's the number that I think that surprise and delight is able to take advantage of, that increasing that brand equity. So um, it's just that simple. I think that it should be a part of if you are doing social media strategy, I think you should have a surprise and delight in it because y'all surprise and delight. These are uh, these don't have to be complicated things. You know, these don't have to be things that that but that means if we're just being frank here, they don't even have to be things that, that are going to cost you hard money and hard funds and different things like that. Is there something of added value? that you know that your prospects really enjoy and like that you can do and that you can bring and that you can provide for somebody like that. That's the thought process that people really need to be in. Just that simple. Going 100%. Full circle, going back to where we started, morality. I think what it really comes down to is most people got into business to do something good, whether it was to solve a problem, to help somebody, to do something that benefited. And you had good intent. And I think this is just one of those other things is, Let's go back into the foundations of we built something for good intent. Surprise and delight is a great way to really honor that customer service, um, you know, value that a lot of businesses have. Take care of the people that you set out to take care of um, when you first started, right? So surprise and delight, we're big fans of it. There is definitely a strategy and the right way to do it. Um, and maybe we get a little bit more deeper into other brands that are doing it successfully um, on a future episode here. All right, let's save these last five to 10 minutes for Super Bowl 2024, Kansas City Chiefs, three Super Bowls. Yeah, Bowl I knew we were going to talk last. about it. First off, <laughs> Super Bowl that everybody wanted both teams to to lose. <laughs> I did. I was one of those people, by the way. So I'll fully take, um, raise my hand for it. I did not want to see them. I wanted to see the Ravens and the Detroit Lions. Um, man, Lions blew it, man. Lions, Lions blew it. Lions blew it. Uh, 
But I, I think we both know that the NFL wasn't ready for a Lions, Baltimore, and Vegas Super Bowl. <laughs> no, no, no. We've been seeing it all year long, right? It was the storyline. You got the um, returning Super, um, Super Bowl um, champions. You have Taylor Swift. You got Travis Kelsey. On the flip side, you got the 49ers. They've been dominating all these, not only all season long, but last few years, you know, they've been up there. They got a pretty stout team. You got the um, Cinderella story with um, Brock Purdy. And it obviously the, the storyline was there. It set out to be a good Super Bowl. The game itself, I will not lie, was fan fantastic. <laughs> Loved it. Um, and then obviously segueing into that, the commercials and the halftime show. And overall, it ended up being a... Uh, Pretty solid Super Bowl in my books, but you're right. The one thing that I did not care for were the two teams that were playing into it. But kudos to the Chiefs. You know, they they got that done. Yeah, I, I'll say so. Some of uh, some things that I took away from that because it, it was you're right. It was a good game and thing. So a few things I think. Um, I think the commercials were very underwhelming. Yeah. Um, there just isn't the focus like they used to be. So, like, for example, there's a couple staples. Do you remember, like, the Budweiser, um, Clydesdale ones? There always was a new one every single year. Heartstrings type of commercial. There just there just isn't that, like, funny effort, like, concerted effort for them. You know, there seems to be a lot more gimmicky stuff, you know, the DoorDash type of one, you know, the scan the QR code. Um, Kanye's, I thought, was pretty interesting. Um, you know, the, the idea of put spending no money on producing a commercial, just mm -hmm. paying for the spots, you know, doing a straight up selfie style video. Yeah. Um, so I think from a commercial standpoint, those are some of the things that I was kind of disappointed. It just, it's like brands didn't put the money and effort into it, but I find it interesting because costs are going up. It's even more expensive for a Super Bowl slot now, actually. Seven million, yeah, right. What was the ticket price this year? Was it 7 million seven. for one? Yeah. Seven. Yeah. Seven million so those are some of my thoughts on that and then um i i guess from a social media standpoint it, it, tying all these things in together i think one of the most interesting things i've seen as a result of all of this and i find this very very crazy and i think only driven by social media did you know that um travis kelsey was somehow voted athlete of the year i did not actually know that. In, this is what's blown mind blowing to me. I don't even care what publication it is. So I don't even need to throw out the publication because he wasn't even kind of close to being the best athlete on his own team. And it wasn't even close. <laughs> so you talk about the impact and obviously she Taylor Swift has and, and, you know, Swifties and we can have conversation about that, but just the impact of social, because all of that stuff still comes from social capital and different things like that. I just think that's, I just think that's incredible. It was. And if you he were a person on his team and literally got voted athlete of the year. And I just, uh, yeah. So it, it just shows the power of social media. It's not about, you know, it kind of reminds me a little bit off, but it reminds me of when I would have conversations back in the day about SEO mm -hmm. and people were like, I don't understand how to do SEO and I don't believe it in different things. And I would always tell people like, listen, our company doesn't know need to know how to do a plumber, do plumbing. We can make a website that ranks better than your site, though, and people will call us <laughs> because it's just about how you execute and do things. It's not about how Every great are you yeah. actually at it. So I just find that type of just it's a reminder for things like that. So many times we're like, well, we're great. We do all of those things. Doesn't matter if people don't know who you are. If people don't know how, who you are and how good you are, it doesn't matter how great you are. I always we used to say best known unfortunately will always be best in class yep. just, so those those are, those are just some of the reminders i took away from it what about yourself i agree i mean the brands i mean we all saw it right the brands that took advantage of being able to find relevancy and what was happening with taylor swift with travis kelsey with the nfl obviously it was a you know she amplified and brought a whole new segment the, and the, it, it was so important obviously the NFL could not stop themselves talking about it. Like, there's so many people, the fans, you know, Taylor herself, other celebrities that, you know, they really, yes, it did it did a lot of good, but I think, honestly, like, they really weren't for it, right? Like, they weren't trying to take the stardom. They weren't trying to be in the spotlight. They weren't wanting all of that to happen. But because social media and obviously who they were so naturally allowed the opportunity to exist, the NFL did what it was almost – hard to um you know move away from which is they took advantage of it if you saw their 
Instagram. Just, Instagram. just say it, just say the real thing, brother. They would have been stupid and it would have been asinine for yeah. them not to do it. Hundred percent, hundred percent. You think about building a generational um brand, right? Like the NFL has been around for. I mean, over 100 years now at this point, if I'm not mistaken, right? It was early 1900. So um, they're doing something that they're wanting to build generational um, brand around, right? And this was one of those opportunities. They obviously took advantage of it. But any other brand out there that was also playing to that relevancy, they were winning, right? So you're right. Am social media just has that um, amplification, that power to do something that historically was really really hard to achieve unless you know you were the very select few now you just have to be good at a craft now it's not easy like i said but you have to be good at an art and a craft that does bring that capability for brands and individuals to do this exact same thing so i want to wrap it up on one thing that you said because I, I think it's one big last highlight that that's important for business owners to know as they kind of watch this and it's it's funny because I'm sure in some of those marketing meetings with the NFL, I'm sure there were people who were like, Swifties aren't the ideal fan. Uh, after this year, if Taylor, for example, if Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey break up, are any of those people actually going to come back and be a Chiefs fan or watch a game or do any of those things? I'm sure they have those conversations. But this is a reminder that sometimes you got to be willing to step out. And it's not about stepping out and being completely off and different than who you are but stepping out and then the benefits of that. So the NFL stepped out and had an entire campaign that touched base with a whole group of people who without this would never could care less about it. I was just checking Forbes did an article. It is minimum, minimum estimated a $350 million increase that the NFL got financially from this right here. Makes sense. That's the type of impact that stepping out can potentially have for your business and things like that. But when you're comfortable and you understand who you are and different things like that, and you get an opportunity to sometimes make a strategic risk, man, these are sometimes why you got to have your stuff together so that you can go out and step out there and do something like that. 100%. That really is a, the perfect um, segue back into, you know, the Super Bowl commercials. $7 million, you know, 115, 120, um, 130 million people or so watching. So, so you ask some experts, they believe the price point um, based on the attention is ju um, is justified. But you're right. Going back to the actual content this year, I will say as people have become more intuitive as marketing, I mean, everybody knows now, Super Bowl outside of obviously for the game itself is for the commercial. So I think people's mindset to the creative for those commercials also started to shift as it just mm -hmm. became more natural, like, hey. People are watching the commercials. People are watching the commercials. Well, get user insight. You're like, great. We got to think about the commercials now, you know, more, more differently than we ever have before. So you're right. I do believe there's a lot of that floofy, foofy, funny, like weird sometimes. I'm sure um, you saw some of the ones that they were running. I have um, a list here, actually, that I started to write. But there was one that was going crazy on social um, about, oh, what was it? What was it? It was the... Oh man, I can't remember it. It was not the Jew one. That one I actually thought was good. Stand up to Jewish hate. But there was one that it was just so weird and they kept showing it. Um kind of thing. It was a Jesus one though. It was some it was a Jesus one. Uh, and it was specifically about Jesus. I can't remember. And I don't want to leave it on that context because people are gonna um think um out <laughs> some religious thing when they want it. They're gonna clip me and say something all oh, crazy. But so let's just talk about some of the good ones, though, because you're right. I think brands did um, approach it wrong. But to kind of justify that $7 million price tag also, I think some brands, you mentioned um, DoorDash, um, they went that logical road, uh, route of like, hey, scan a QR code. Um, and some people found that as like, I'm looking for a Super Bowl commercial. Like, you know, what are you, what are you here showing me? And then some people found it as like, hey, it's an actionable step. Like, I got to see an ROI, right? Like, I've spent $7 yeah. million dollars behind this piece of creative. No, and I get it. Just, <laughs> that's not to create the creative. People sometimes forget that. That's to run the placement on TV. You still that's have to hire those celebrities. Not, yeah, you still know. have to get the production done. Like, it was, it's pretty big scale things that people tend to forget. So I think some brands did it right. Some brands didn't. Um, and I think we, we're running short on time now, so we can save some of the 
favorites. Hopefully people are leaving some of their super favorite Super Bowl commercials in the comments and we can talk about them in a future episode. But before we kind of segue and sign off for the day, did you have a favorite um, one that you actually liked? I did. I did. And it's you You probably already know it because you know me very well. Uh, mine was the Deadpool versus Wolverine. Yeah, I actually, oh my God, that was epic. As soon as it came, my wife was like, oh my God, Deadpool. And I was like, okay, another Deadpool movie. But then they got me with the Wolverine because I, for a long time, Wolverine's been like one of my favorite superheroes. So they got me with that. I'm excited. I'm looking forward to that. I can't wait. What about you? My favorite, favorite, and I think it's just because of all the recent hype that's happened, but was the, and I don't even really like beer in general or Michelob Ultra, but um Michelob Ultra with the messy actually because that was a pretty yeah. Interest, yeah that was an interesting commercial I liked it recently um I've been hanging around with people that um they like Michelob Ultra so I was drinking Michelob Ultra so it's just like I think the perfect timing of the relevancy for me it doesn't work out for everybody but I was drinking it recently it was messy the world cup wasn't that long ago and it all kind of like tied into me and I was like that's nice that was a pretty good commercial so that one and then I think T-Mobile did um a very good job also just on playing on top of what they've been known for which is oh yeah 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 they're the cool you know cell phone brand right and i think that's what their commercials have always portrayed that's what they always go after but verizon surprised me they went you know with beyonce they went for a global approach obviously they're the leader in that segment um but they they're really trying to stick out and keep help people still remember that you know they're the big player out here and they're the one to beat but i'm a biased fan towards t-mobile so i like that one um, but there, there were some brands in my opinion that definitely stuck out this year. Definitely. Cool. Well, y'all, uh, listen, we're going to be signing off on episode 21 of seriously social. As always, we appreciate your time. This is Lorenzo and Kosha with y'all. We will be back in a few weeks. Uh, like I said, we've already kind of alluded to a few different topics we're going to be having. We've already got a few guests already lined up, y'all. Our guest roster this year is going to be literally, uh, it's going to be next level, y'all. So we cannot wait until next time. And without further ado, uh, we're signing off, y'all. Appreciate y'all. Subscribe now. Check us out on YouTube, uh, Spotify, wherever podcasts are found. Can't wait to see you again, brother. Appreciate everybody. Have a good one. Till next time. Yes, sir.